Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for this workshop. I'm Mark Polisinski. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of OKI. We are absolutely overjoyed with the remarkable number of people that are on this Zoomer. We have over 100 people signed up, and we're really, really happy and thankful for many of you. Many of you filled out the survey in advance of this workshop. I've been uh, CEO for OKI for almost two decades, and I think the thing I'm most proud of is that we at OKI, from our staff to our board, have sought to find real solutions to real problems for our community. We're planners, we're a planning organization, we're federal planners at that, so we understand the absolute necessity of having plans. But we also know that the end game of any plan is to put a project in the ground. And that's what we hope this workshop will kick off. We are holding this workshop today to get EV charging stations in the ground by assisting our communities in securing financing, by introducing communities to partners who can provide expertise. If you don't have the right expertise, that financing that you've secured could be spent very inefficiently, which we don't want our communities to be doing. We also want to help our communities secure turnkey and no or low cost maintenance investments for our communities. And maybe most proudly, we want to introduce OKI's EV Locator app to aid communities in their EV location decisions. We're doing all this because OKI believes that EV adoption will accelerate very fast. Uh, much faster than what we envisioned even a year ago. And to do this, we're going to need an EV charging network. Markets know more than we do, and markets are telling something to all of us that's very important. And this is best exemplified by the fact that 100 EV monocle models will be coming on to US markets by 2020. The question I think is why does OKI believe that EVs will be coming on faster and why is the marketplace signaling to us that EVs will be accelerating in, our, in the marketplace? It's not just a marketing campaign. There are practical economic reasons why EVs will be surging. The average EV is three and a half times more efficient than the internal combustion engine vehicle. EVs have a lower cost of ownership than do ICE vehicles which helps offset the larger initial costs that EVs tend to have. As environmental concerns grow, the advantages of EVs will become more apparent to the general public. However, to meet the demand for EVs and charging stations, we have the problem of cost. There is a high cost to installing EV charging networks, particularly for smaller communities who want to have and be part of an EV charging network. There are various sources of funding for EV installations. Some of these you know of, and those sources are represented here today. Some of these sources you may not be familiar with, and they are represented here today. Again, the funding that we're looking for is necessary because we at OKI believe that we're beginning to see a major shift in EV purchases. This is best exemplified in our neck of the woods. If you look at the number of EV registrations in Southwest Ohio for the year 2018, they equaled all of the EV registrations for all previous years combined. So it seems as though the future is robust. As this is a background, I'm now going to introduce you to David Shuey. David is OKI's GIS manager. He'll serve as your MC today. And he's going to start by giving you the results of the survey that many of you took in preparation of this workshop. David? Thank you, Mark, and welcome, everyone. We are very excited about the topic of today's webinar and hope that it will begin to move the needle towards wider EV adoption in our region. We've assembled an outstanding and knowledgeable lineup of speakers for you today. By the end of today's webinar, you will see that there are a variety of funding opportunities and partnerships available to help with the acquisition of EV infrastructure and fleets across the OKI region. Let's start by taking a quick look at today's agenda. So first up, I'm going to give you a quick overview of the results of the survey that you took last week. Uh, we do appreciate everyone that did this. Um, 
Second on our agenda, we're going to dig into VW settlement funds. And VW settlement funds, we're going to have updates from Indiana, Kentucky, and Ohio on each of the programs and where they are and uh, when you can begin to apply for this funding source. Uh, then I'll give you a quick overview of our EV charger locator, uh, a tool that we've developed that we believe uh, will help um, ease the siting of EV chargers throughout the region. Uh, up next will be partnership opportunities and Kevin Cushman with, C with Electrata is gonna give an overview of uh, the opportunities that they are gonna present with partnering for EVs. Uh, next, we will have utility company incentives. Uh, Robin Bancroft of our staff will present that. And finally, uh, Andy Rees of our staff will talk about fleet funding opportunities through some of OKI's pool of funding. And finally, we will end up with some questions and discussion. In order to move through the agenda efficiently today, we will be answering questions after the completion of all presentations. Feel free to type your questions in the Q&A box below and when we will answer them during the allotted time at the end of our webinar. So on to our survey results. Uh, I wanna first thank everyone who took the time to complete it. Uh, we know that people survey you death at times and we appreciate you taking the time to fill this out. Uh, the results of the survey reinforced many of our beliefs on the status of EVs in the OKI region. If we begin to review these results, we see that results revealed two key themes. First, there's a rising awareness about EVs in our region, and we need infrastructure to support widespread adoption. Second, funding is an issue for many of our communities and fleet operators. Let's dig a little bit deeper into each of these themes. First, EVs are coming. Over 60% of survey respondents are beginning to hear more about EVs becoming important and notice more EVs in their communities. Economic and smart city are the strongest motivating factors to deploy EV infrastructure for survey respondents. Over 70% of survey respondents consider the availability of EV charging infrastructure to be extremely important and very important service for their communities. 80% of you think that EV drivers should pay about the same or less to travel the same number of miles than if they drove a gasoline-fueled car. Now let's dig a little bit into the lack of funding theme. Over 67% of respondents said that EV charging equipment was expensive and there was no funding for it. Over 80% of respondents indicated that it was important to pursue EV infrastructure or fleet conversion. However, funding was at risk given other issues, or there was no budget for it at the current time, or it was a lower priority to be revisited when funding becomes available. Funding remained a constant theme or lack thereof throughout the survey and our results that we saw. And then finally, there's some areas that remain unclear. There still exists a lot of confusion about the number of EV drivers registered in each community, how many are actually out there. People anecdotally see EVs, but, but there's a lack of hard data to how many currently exist. And then finally, transitioning their fleets to electric is still not a top priority for respondents, with most being out one to two years in the future, which was 20%, out three to five years being 16% of respondents, and not being a priority in the foreseeable future was 33%. Yet, more discussion about fleet transition was needed. Next, I'd like to drill down into three questions in the survey, which are the most salient to today's discussion. First one is question number five. How important do you believe it is for EV charging infrastructure to be available to your constituents or residents? Almost 72% of you responded that access to EV chargers was either extremely or very important. Moreover, if you include, include the somewhats, nearly 95% feel it's important. Uh, so obviously, uh, EV chargers is something that we want for our communities and for our residents. Uh, but if we start to look at these next couple of questions, we'll find out why that's not occurring. So question seven, how has the importance to pursue EV, EV infrastructure or fleet conversion changed for your community or organization in the last year? No one responded that EV infra infrastructure was both a top priority and currently funded. Uh, so zero res responses there. 55% responded that is important, but either funding is at risk or not budgeted, while 25% indicated that it's a lower priority and will be revisited when funding becomes available. And finally, question nine, what is the main reason for the lack or limited number of EV charging stations in your community? 
Over 67% of respondents said that EV charging equipment was expensive and there was no funding for it. Only one person responded that EV charging stations are not needed in our community. So as you can see, there's clearly a need for EV chargers, but funding is really the, the, the largest hurdle right now to getting more EV chargers in place, which uh, makes us excited to sort of talk to you today about some of the opportunities that are gonna be presented to you soon. Up first, we're gonna hear from Indiana, Kentucky, and Ohio on VW sediment funds and the status of those funds in each state. Our first presenter today is Carrie Garvin, the director of Greater Indiana Clean Cities. Carrie, the floor is yours. Morning, everyone. Um, and thanks for having um, Greater Indiana represented today. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen so we can um, get my presentation started. Um, as David mentioned, I am the director for Greater Indiana Clean Cities. Uh, we focus on advancing communities with education and resources on alternative fuels and transportation. Our mission is to advance alternative domestic fuel transportation, including energy efficient technologies across all sectors in Indiana. We are a standalone nonprofit 501c3 organization serving, serving 76 counties in the state, uh, working with public and private sector members. For 21 years, we have been assisting cities, schools, utilities, fueling companies, government agencies, universities, and other nonprofit organizations with their alternative fuel fleet projects. We have around 80 members and stakeholders that work with us on collaborative opportunities, whether it is for funding opportunities, infrastructure development, or fleet deployment. Together, we host educational and networking events, fostering opportunities for partnerships between fleets and industry providers. As you can see, we have several of our champion members listed today. We also have many um, what we call leader and advocate stakeholders listed on our website. Um, their membership has helped fund our work to deploy alternative fuels and technologies throughout the state. For those of you that don't know, I do a little, re uh, a little recap on what Clean Cities do, and um, so you'll appreciate my, the next speaker, which is Emily, for another Clean City Coalition. Uh, Clean Cities focuses on four major activities, um, local and national partnerships, where we convene key community and business leaders to develop and implement projects, leverage resources, and address local barriers through the program's coalition. We also work with national partnerships to leverage resources nationwide to engage with larger fleets and organizations. Um, information and education, we develop data-driven tools to help consumers save money on fuel costs and help fleets understand their options for cost-effective alternatives. Under technical and problem-solving assistance, we help local leaders address permitting and safety issues, technology shortfalls, and other implementation barriers. Um, and under competitively awarded financial assistance, we use federal awards to provide funds that encourage an initial private sector match and long-term investment. Um, so this framework is bolstered by local support through designated clean city coalitions like ours, um, who have their pulse on the local market conditions and um, priorities. So let's get to the biggie, which is the VW settlement. Um, Indiana is receiving approximately $40.9 million from the Volkswagen Trust in at least three separate installments. Um, it started in 2019, with all funds being fully dispersed by 2028. 15% of the state's $40.9 million can be used for light duty electric vehicle charging equipment, for direct current fast chargers or level two charging equipment. Grants under this program are administered by the Indiana Department of Environmental Management, or IDEM, and overseen by the Indiana Volkswagen Environmental Mitigation Trust Fund Committee, say that three times fast, and the Indiana Volkswagen Environmental Trust Fund Program announced the RFP, which states that funding is available for both DC fast charging and level two equipment. Proposals uh, may include projects that focus on a single statewide EV charging network, as well as regional, local, or individual charging network installations. The total estimated funding for this competitive grant opportunity is $6.15 million. 
Of the $6.15 million available, $615,000 has been designated for level two charging equipment and $5.53 million for direct current fast charging equipment. Applicants may submit more than one application. However, each application must request funds for either DC fast charging or level two, but not both. Um, each application may include more than one charging site location. And if submitting more than one charging site location in an application, the applicant must prioritize sequentially the charging site locations at the time of submission. General requirements for the station include uh, being publicly accessible and available to drivers 24-7, providing a universal payment system, providing clear signage and paved parking spaces, and the equipment being networked by Wi-Fi or cellular connection. In addition to general requirements for stations, there are specific requirements for each type of charger. For the CFC sites or fast charging sites, um, the following should be taken into consideration. Uh, they must be located within one road mile from the interstate and highways identified within the RFP. Of the road, roadways identified, um, 65, 69, 70, 80, and 465 have the highest average daily traffic totals. DCFC sites must also be rated at a minimum of 100 kW. This can be accomplished by pairing two 50 kW stations um, in, in a manner where one vehicle can obtain a minimum of 100 kW charging level, but the equipment will also charge two vehicles separately at a minimum of 50 kW. And each uh, DCFC station must offer both CHADMO and SA SAE combo or CCS charging system uh, compatible connectors. For level two charging equipment, stations must include J1772 compatible chargers. Indiana intends to allocate 100% of the $6.15 million through a single round of funding for EV charging across the state. All applicants must demonstrate that each station and location has a high potential for use. Projects funder, funded under this program will be reimbursed at the maximum dollar amount per charging location or percentage of the total location specific project cost, whichever is less. For DCFC equipment that is publicly available, applications can receive a maximum of $180,000 per location for government agencies and 160,000 for non-government agencies. Non-public locations can receive a maximum of 120,000 per location. For level two equipment that is publicly available, government agencies may be eligible for 9,000 per location, while non-government agencies can receive up to 8,000 per location. Mandatory cost shares are required for all projects. Reimbursement of eligible costs will only be provided up to the maximum dollar amount or percentage of total costs associated for each equipment type. The remaining project costs are the responsibility of the grantee and serve as the grantee's cost share. Preference will be given to proposals that include a financial cost share match over and above those detailed in the RFP. Uh, the rubric for, for proposals place a strong emphasis on the cost effectiveness of the project based on a ratio of the total investment of the W program fund to the annual average daily traffic at project location. Um, they also take into consideration the long-term sustainability and maintenance of the site or the ability to continue efforts or expand the project after the mitigation project funding is used and whether the project complements other programs for a statewide network or the application itself supports a statewide network, uh, especially the ability of the proposal to meet the goal for a statewide network and to fill in the infrastructure gap. Other evaluation criteria include verified leverage, um, leveraging of additional resources, project readiness, and quality of site marketing and amenities. So they are looking at uh, if you provide restrooms, food, and shopping uh, also around those locations. Proposals are due September 23rd uh, at 5 p.m. <laughs> Eastern Time. Indiana anticipates awarding cooperative agreements 
subject to the availability of funds and the quality of the, the proposals received. The Indiana Volkswagen Environmental Mitigation uh, Trust Fund Committee expects to select projects by the end of October 2020 with funds awarded soon thereafter. All projects must be completed and fully implemented by December 31st, 2022. And all stations must be in, or in operation with a commitment from the owners to maintain them for five years. Uh, the website's listed here for more information. If you go to www.in.gov slash item slash air quality, you can find the RFP and they have a handy dandy FAQ sheet they just posted the other day. Um, Greater Indiana also helps with EV planning and grant writing assistance. Uh, <clears throat> if you guys need any assistance, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, we are happy to help. Thank you. Carrie, thank you so much. As always, yeah. great things are happening in Indiana. Up next, our next presenter will be Emily Carpenter, who is the Executive Director of Kentucky Clean Fuels Coalition. Emily, you have the virtual podium. Hello, everyone. Just letting it pull up. Perfect, thank you for confirming. Um, this will be a nice quick update um, from Kentucky. Um, we are in a very interesting place right now in the state because the main buckets, if you will, of where that money is going to go for VW settlement was just announced actually last month. Um, so we are a clean cities organization, um, just like um, Grady and Indiana. Um, we work with fleets across the state um, and, and those interested in infrastructure to help them get those installed and help them get funding for those. Um, for the Volkswagen settlement in Kentucky, um, we received um, 20.3 million and the energy and environment cabinet, who is the individuals responsible for leading the program, um, they uh, agreed to have 15% of that money go towards electric vehicle infrastructure so that um, is just a little bit over $3 million. Now I say we're at an exciting point because they actually just ended a couple weeks ago on July 10th, a um, comment period where they're still getting information and trying to make decisions as to where that money is going to go within EV charging. So it could go to public entities, private entities. It could be level three with the DC fast chargers. It could be level two and all of that is being determined right now. The one thing that they did let everyone know is they are requesting um, for 50% at least matching funds for whatever project that um, does get funded. But as of now, um, those are the primary updates because they are putting the entire project uh, program together as to how the RFPs will work and um, where that money will be allocated within that bucket. So I'm here to answer any questions or help you all through uh, and if you need to um, submit some information, if you have some preferences, just let me know. And we'll, we've been coordinating with the Energy Environment Cabinet every step of the way. Thank you very much, Emily. We appreciate the update. Uh, we look forward to the program being rolled out in Kentucky. And as Emily mentioned, if you have input on their program, please reach out to her and they will pass that along to the appropriate people at the, at the Cabinet. Our next presenter is Aladdin Aladdin. He is the Assistant Chief at the Ohio Environmental Protection Agency. Aladdin, the Zoom floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for that introduction. My name is Aladdin Aladdin. You did hear correctly. Uh, I believe my parents thought that that would build character or at least my therapy builds. Either way, I'm uh, pleased to join you all today. Um, and, and I want to thank uh, the preceding speakers as well. It's, um, um, uh, good to be on this call. Um, Kentucky used to be my former home, so I, I uh, was encouraged and excited to hear from them as well. Uh, I'm going to try to move pretty swiftly through the slides, uh, but just know that the link that you see on the web, the epa.ohio.gov slash OEE, literally everything I'm going to say in the next 10 to 15 minutes will be on that web page. So feel free to, to, to reach out or, or look for that information anywhere uh, you need to. Uh, with that, um, each state, uh, the VW program is a little bit different. Uh, we're all part of the larger $14 billion VW settlement. Um, of that, uh, monies were allocated to each state, uh, proportional, uh, proportional to, proportionate to 
um, how many of those vehicles were registered in that state. Uh, Ohio shares $75 million from the VW settlement, of which every state was allowed to allocate a maximum of 15%. So our maximum allowable, we opted to take the, allot the maximum 15% to electric vehicle charging infrastructure, and that comes out to about a little over $11 million in our case. Again, all of this information is in, on our um, VW plan on our website that was in the first slide. Um, and this should also give you a quick look at the 26 counties between the yellow uh, shaded counties as well as the blue striped counties. Um, if you add them together, there are 26 of our counties uh, that uh, are eligible to receive funding under the VW program. Uh, for those of you in Southwest Ohio, uh, Claremont, Hamilton, Butler, and Warren are all eligible counties. And, and I really hope you all are able to take advantage of this, um, you know, I don't want to say once in a lifetime, but once in a long time funding opportunity. Um, overall, just to speak to Ohio's VW charging approach, uh, we're very committed to make this, these chargers uh, uh, fund chargers at publicly available locations only. Uh, there's all sorts of data that uh, proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that workplace charging is a good thing, that charging at multi-unit dwellings, new apartment complexes are, uh, get very high use. So we don't make, we don't argue that. We are actually very supportive of anyone installing those, but because we view VW funding as public dollars, we like to put our funds uh, into projects or locations that will be available to any members of the public. Uh, and I'll speak a little bit more about that later. Um, applicants in our program can be government or non-government. Um, we wanted to keep this as broad as possible. Um, and we generally view, um, in Ohio's view generally, uh, the state of Ohio's, is that level two locations can help meet local demand uh, for charging um, and also increase awareness for electric vehicles and we hope it'll spur EV adoption and we tend to think of DCFCs or fast chargers as more about connecting uh, people who uh, you know allowing people the ability to travel within the state or outside the state for that matter um, and and be able to get off the interstate get off a major highway charge in 20 minutes and then get back on and be on their way so generally that's like our governing philosophy, although you'll often see DC fast charters in an urban core somewhere in a downtown or vice versa as well. But that's just wanted to share um, as you listen to the rest of my remarks, like the governing philosophy of how we're approaching this. So real quick, our timeline has been that uh, we first set out, um, I remember I just uh, joined the program around that time and, and um, and if you want to figure out whose bright idea it was to travel 26 counties in Ohio in the dead of winter and meet with stakeholders um, to get their input, that was me. <laughs> so my colleague Carolyn and I went and had meetings with all 26, uh, related to all 26 priority counties. OKI was a gracious host of our meeting for the Southwest portion um, of the state. And we basically, rather than coming up with a program and then telling everybody what, they, what requirements they needed to meet, uh, to be part of the program, we actually went out and we asked everybody, what would it take for you to participate? And how do you want us to structure this program? And we talked to stakeholders, a broad range from municipalities, businesses, um, uh, service providers like vendors, utilities, we've engaged with them. And then uh, we did a couple of things. We helped uh, Ohio DS with a state term service contract, uh, and I'll talk about that in a little bit here. And there's also a study out there, if you Google Drive Ohio, EV charging study, uh, if you're in the state of Ohio, it'll give you a broad picture. And this is a very, very new, just from this release last month, when we helped them with that study, it'll give you a very broad picture of the state of EV charging uh, in Ohio and where uh, there's a sense that we need to go, especially on DC fast charging. And then um, the level two RFA is what I'm here to talk to you about today. You know, that's where the you are here sign points you to. And coming down the pipe, uh, we um, hope to release another RFA for electric school bus pilot study towards the end of this year. And we're going to do DC fast charging around February of next year. So unlike Indiana, we chose to separate our uh, level two versus DC fast charging offerings, primarily because of you know, what I mentioned in the previous slide, which was that we think of them as serving sort of different needs. 
uh, not that one is right and one is not, it's just the way we were thinking about it here in Ohio. Uh, so with that, I did want to stop because many of you are municipalities. I wanted to make you aware that one of the things we work with DAS uh, last year uh, was, as you all must be familiar with state term service contracts, if you're a public entity, you probably used it to buy different types of often perishable or, or, or quick use kind of items as a state government entity, schools, uh, counties, local governments use it often. We actually worked with them to create um, this contract for EV charging equipment. And so the state of Ohio uh, went out and initiated a public procurement process. They invited bids from every vendor um, and they received about 13 bids and ultimately signed contracts with seven vendors. Um, now, I have to tell you that since that point, I mean, early on, we were going to do that. And the very next month, we were going to issue this RFP for our level two charging funding, correct? But there's been such a big gap between the two happening that many more vendors have come in uh, to existence or expressed an interest in Ohio's VW program. So what we did was we adopted a middle ground. On one hand, we chose not to limit our applicants to only use one of those seven vendors. Uh, but the other hand, we also didn't kind of just completely lose the value of that effort. So when you submit an application, and there's a slide towards the end that talks about that, uh, there are a number of, there are nine uh, kind of criterion for ranking. One of those criteria, all others being equal, is if you use uh, the public, um, this DAS contract for public entities, then you get uh, you know, a, a higher priority, maybe some bonus points or something like that for using that. But, but the information of the person that administers this contact, uh, this contract is on your screen and the link is there as well. And I'll share the slides with OKI and they can share it with every one of you that's on this call if you want to take a look at that. Again, it's not a requirement. I wanna make that very clear. It's not a requirement that you use it. It's just a service that's available if you're a public entity and I wanted to be sure you're aware of that. So in terms of this current uh, grant offering, again, uh, it, was, it opened on July 1st. Uh, we did a few webinars to educate people about that. We have the recording from that webinar, the PowerPoint slide, and a Q&A document that are all posted on our website, on the Ohio EPA's website. And that Q&A document, we plan to update every week or every other week as the questions keep coming in. Um, you know, no matter how much thought you put into the document, there's invariably something that's not as clear as it needs to be, or there's something you didn't address in the RFA, I didn't address in the RFA document, and we still get really good head scratcher questions and we're responding to them. And in the interest of fairness, we're gonna post this document, um, you know, at least once every week or once every other week so that all our applicants are aware of the responses we're giving people. Uh, the applications are due on September 30th at 3 p.m. And then we hope to make grant awards under this program in around the middle of January. Um, a, a big picture about funding. Again, you can see the counties that are eligible and certainly the four counties in your area are uh, part of that. Uh, this is for level two only. A DC FAST will be separate. Um, there's $3.25 million being made available for level two. We're gonna do about five or $6 million later for DC FAST, uh, but for now 3.25 million of which the 0.25 is set aside for actual state government facilities. There are some ODNR, parks and lodges, ODOT, um, district garages, uh, two of our most po you know, popular BMV locations in the state. We hope to put EV charging there. So we've set aside that $250,000 for them. Now, of the remaining $3 million, the plan is that we would like to spend $115,000 per county in each of the 26 counties. You've got to have an eligible location and all that. You've got to have a solid application. But ideally, in a perfect world, that's what would happen, is that we would be able to invest 115000 in each of these counties. That is why we're really recommending people, you know, far and wide, if you're in one of these counties, this is your opportunity. Again, it may be a once in a long time opportunity for you to take advantage of this because we would rather spread, spread the funding by county and even put chargers where none exists or very few exists, uh, even if we uh, know that, you know, it, it may be a little while before demand builds up to catch up to the infrastructure. It's kind of a chicken and an egg thing, right? When people see chargers, they're more likely to buy an electric car 
But when people buy an electric car, they're more likely to, than to use a publicly available charger. And we understand that. And so that's what we're trying to attempt is to put, this, put these chargers as far and wide as possible. So please take advantage of this opportunity um, and, uh, you know, and put together a good application and, and, and we hope to hear from you. So $115,000 for your county, that's the key word to keep in mind. How is that gonna be split based on chargers? So the settlement actually talks about it in, and, and we borrow language as directly from the VW settlement as we can. What, the, what that does for us is that because this is a reimbursement program, meaning you have to shell out money out of your pocket, get the project done and then get reimbursed, we want to be 120% sure that you will get reimbursed by the settlement. So we try to stick as close as possible to the settlement language. And so at a government owned property, that's our distinction. No matter who puts the charger, even if someone else operates it, it's fundamentally based on the piece of land that that charger is sitting on. If it's on a government owned property, you're eligible for 100% of the eligible cost, the lesser of the two amounts, or you can get 7,500 per single port charger or $15,000 for a dual port charger. And then at a non-government owned property, the same things stand except instead of 100%, we're doing 80% eligible cost and, ex and, 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 and expecting our non-government partners to chip in the other 20% as their cost share for this project. So the keywords are government owned, and then 80 or 100% based on single, um, you know, based on that, single or dual port, and then whichever is lesser. So the maximum that the state of Ohio is reimbursing anyone per port of charging is $7,500. So it's just an important number to keep in mind. As I mentioned earlier, this is a reimbursement grant. You've got to be in an eligible location, and this has to be publicly available. The other thing that we're doing that's a little different than most other states out there is that, oh, by the way, before I say that, yes, and the equipment has to be purchased. It can't be leased EV charging equipment. Um, there are good reasons sometimes to lease an EV charger, but the settlement specifically uses the word purchase. And again, that's why we're sticking to that. Now, what we're doing a little bit differently than most other states is we're requiring that every charger we fund, A, be networked for five years so we can collect data and users can find them, um, or, and they be covered by an extended five-year warranty and a five-year service contract. And that's why our allow allocation per charger is higher than many other states. Actually, just about every other state we looked at, we've allotted more money because we know these things come at a cost, but we want you to incur that cost so that these chargers are operated and maintained in the way that they're intended. And also there's a reporting requirement. Uh, you're gonna need to submit reports for five years um, after you start operating so that we can collect that data on behalf of the state. And you as a site host can have that data to see if this was worth your while, you know, see what the trends are. And, and you know, MPOs would love you for collecting that kind of information as well, as it would allow us to plan um, not only for the present, but for the future as well, based on that information. So all of this is set up with that in mind, with putting in chargers that will be installed properly, operated and maintained properly, and then reported on. None of this is intended to put an additional burden on you. This is all things that can be easily done. The vendors we've talked to have said it's easily doable for them as well. A few quick, you know, when you look at our program, again, you've got to be in eligible county, which uh, most if not all of you must be. If you're in Ohio and those four counties, uh, there are requirements for what sites are eligible, which applicants are eligible, and what eligible costs are. Uh, again, nothing major to point out, just about we try to keep it as broad as possible, and these things are all listed in the documents. And if you have any specific questions, I'd be happy to answer them. We also have some project site requirements um, or the, and charging equipment requirements, and all of these things are listed in the RFA. If you've thumbed through the RFA, it may seem a little long because of the attachments and everything, but we tried really hard to make sure it makes sense and it flows in a way that would be like, if you were to go out and do this yourself with or without VW funding, then we hope that you would proceed down the same path of putting your project together. We hope the RFA mirrors that, that thought pattern. And then finally, when you, when you put together an application, these are the four pieces. 
The fourth one does not apply to governmental uh, bodies, but it applies to private entities who may apply. There's a finance requirement, but basically there's a project proposal, there's a budget you need to submit, and there's an application certification statement, all of which is on our website. Um, how, once we get all, all, all these applications in, how do we plan to rank them? Well, these are the nine criterion that I mentioned to you earlier. The number one among them is, how much are you asking us to invest the VW, for a single port, for a port that you will make available to the public? I'll say that again, for each EV charging port that you make available to members of the public, how much are you asking Ohio EPA to invest? So obviously the less you ask us for, the more higher your project is going to score because that becomes more cost effective. Now there are other factors on there like uh, I mentioned earlier, uh, you've, you know, charging stations that are further away uh, from other existing charging stations will actually get a higher priority, which again means that if you're outside one of the big three, you know, if you're outside of Cincinnati or, or you know, uh, Hamilton County, then or in Butler or Warren or something, then you're more likely even to get a higher score within your county because you're further away from the next available charger. Uh, when I availability, just want to make the point that we've got a requirement for a minimum of 16 hours a day that you have to have the charger available to people. But if you can make it 24 hours, then that project will score even higher. Uh, there is a criteria for being sort of in a high traffic area and the RFA will give you details about how to calculate that so that we have a consistent bar, you know, bar for everybody who's applying. Uh, we want these chargers to go in close to where there are amenities like restaurants and gas stations and so on. Um, so uh, that is a higher priority for us. We also would like to see multiple chargers in a location. Now, I understand that in some cases, you know, it's so remote and so first time that you want to put one single port charger and see what happens. And that's the commitment you're willing to make. Uh, but generally, we'd like to see at least one dual port charger or two single port chargers as whatever works better for you in your location. So that, and so multiple chargers will actually get a higher priority. Um, and then scalability or future proofing, meaning if you do the site prep and if the conduit that you lay, the electrical service that's there is capable of taking more chargers in the future, then those proposals will get a higher ranking in our books. Um, I mentioned the state term service contract for public entities earlier on. Again, most of you, I presume, are. If you use that, then you get a priority. And finally, if you're a destination charger, like say a Kings Island uh, in your case, then that would be a higher priority for funding as well. Uh, with that, I just want to kind of close with one, you know, a couple of quick reminders. One is that ultimately this all gets combined into one PDF application and you email it to evcharging at epa.ohio.gov before September 30th at 3 p.m. That's how you get your application in. Uh, feel free to contact myself, my colleague Carolyn Watkins, her information is there as well. But, but if you've kind of tuned out for the, for the last 5, 10, 15 minutes and you're tuning back in, Here's what I want to leave you with. As I mentioned earlier, like our view of this program is that this is Ohio EPA's way of partnering with Ohio communities, businesses, with our EV vendors, with our contractors, our planning organizations, so that we can actually deploy these level two EV charging stations in Ohio in a way that serves current EV owners and it helps them, but it also encourages non-owners to consider an electric vehicle. And in turn, what this gets us all is cleaner air in Ohio. So we'll only get there if we get as many as possible solid, well-thought, well-written applications across the 26 counties. So we're really blessed with some really good MPOs. You guys are blessed with OKI in your region. I would encourage you, no matter how big or small or small a community you are, lean on OKI, lean on us, and take advantage of this opportunity to put together an application I know one MPO, for example, that's collecting, or they're the ones that are putting together the applications for the many small communities in, in a certain county. So each application has to be limited to a certain county. So they're actually collecting those applications or they're actually helping them put together a combined application. And they, those are things that we're happy to talk to anybody about. So again, lean on your MPO on OKI to help you with this process. The, the, you know, the worst case scenario in this case is that this funding comes available and it's not put to good use in a way that it'll 
help our state today and in the future as we move forward with the EV charging infrastructure landscape. We really want to get this, these funds out, but we want them to go to good solid projects that will actually serve the interests of the public and help improve air quality. So again, I mean, reach out to OKI, reach out to me if you have any questions or comments about any of this. And um, with that, I'll, I'll wait on questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Loudon, for that very informative presentation. And I would recommend for our Ohio members that have not had a chance to watch the Ohio EPA uh, webinar they recorded a couple of weeks ago. And if you're interested in this funding source, I would highly recommend that you go out and watch that. It was very well done. Uh, it's very detailed, takes you through the entire process. And uh, again, it's definitely worth your watch if you're considering applying for this funding opportunity. Um, as you can see, the VW Settlement Funds present a great opportunity to jumpstart EV charger installations in our region. And we really hope that you will take advantage of these opportunities and apply for this funding source. And as Alad mentioned, if you happen to have questions or if we can be a resource to you, uh, don't hesitate to reach out either to myself or Robin Bancroft on our staff, and we'll be more than glad to help you in any way that we can. Now we'd like to, to, for you to answer a couple of questions based upon the first three presentations that you've seen. Uh, what we wanna know is, uh, your EV charging station plans and for VW funding. Jen, would you load the first question for us? And so the first question is, uh, do you plan to apply for EV charging stations funding through one of the state Volkswagen mitigation trust fund programs? And the second question is, if you plan on doing that, how many charging ports do you plan on applying for? So if you go ahead and fill that out for us and we'll take a look at the results. And it looks like about 60% of you uh, 60% that are responding plan on applying for funds. 4% uh, are a no, and about 36% of you need more information. Uh, so again, if we can be a resource in gaining that additional information, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. When it looks at the number of charging ports that you plan on putting in, uh, it's pretty evenly spread there. You got 13%, there are one or two, 18%, three or four. Uh, 16% or seven, and then unsure about half of you. So again, not quite clear on exactly what you're gonna do there, but it is very encouraging for us to see uh, this number of people that are interested in this, these programs. Up next, uh, I'd like to introduce you to the EV charging station locator app that OKI has developed. Uh, we developed this app to help locate EV charging stations within our region. You can assess the app by going to gis.oki.org slash EV or by visiting the OKI website and navigating to the maps and app section. You'll see it clearly located there. And so what I'd like to do is, is run you through this app real quick. Uh, I just did screenshots today because with the resolution on a monitor and trying to share it here, it's a little bit more difficult to do a live presentation. But I think this will give you a, a basic understanding of uh, how to use the app and, and how it works and what you can get out of it. Again, uh, you can go to gis.oki.org slash EV to access it. And when you first go there, you'll be uh, welcomed by a welcome screen that's going to give you an overview uh, about the application and how it's used and why it's important. And then a little explanation about the two different types of chargers that you can cite using this application. So when you get in, you'll be presented with this screen. And the first thing you'll need to do is decide whether or not you want to locate a DC fast charger or a level two charger. In this example, we're going to stick with a level two charger for today. And so when you do that, uh, you'll, get, you'll see a map of the region. And this app is intended for use just in the OKI region right now. We don't have resources or capabilities at this point in time to collect the data that we would need to expand it beyond the OKI region, uh, but for applicants within our OKI region, we think this will provide a valuable resource for you. So the first thing you need to do is either uh, enter in an address, if you have an address for the location, or you can click the choose on map button and zoom into the map and click the location that you'd like to locate your EV charger. Once you do that, uh, there'll be an EV icon that we presented on the map and you'll begin to see things start to calculate. And so when you look at the map, there'll be a legend below it. It's gonna look at, show you where the proposed charging station is. 
It's gonna show you nearby traffic counts, uh, where park and pool and park and ride locations are. Uh, little gray dots represent amenities. And so in our amenities, that's either a shopping center, a shopping mall, or some type of restaurant. It will also show you alternative fuel corridors, which are represented by green dashed lines. And then there'll be a red line that represents the route to the highest functionally classified road within a quarter of a mile. This is something new that we added to our app recently. And this was in response to uh, the request by OEPA to have this as information is collected. With that said, um, OEPA would still like you to use their procedure for demonstrating this information by using the O.TIM site. Again, so we have it built in here for you for your reference, but if you're doing an OEPA application, make sure that you follow their guidance and guidelines for uh, collecting this information as well. Uh, they do require, they want to have um, sort of a level playing field for everyone to pull from. And then finally, you'll see level two chargers and Tesla chargers. And we split those out uh, because obviously Tesla, ch Tesla chargers are unique to Teslas. Um, and if you're driving a non-Tesla, you really can't use that charging station for anything else. And so if you scroll down a little bit further below the legend, what you'll see is a summary of the, your site that you've created here. And again, we've, we've created this in a way so that we feel like it's uh, very user-friendly, very easy, easy to use. Once you select your site, there's very little for you to do. The application does all the work for you. So the first thing it'll tell you is the type of analysis that you're looking at. In this case, we're looking at level two chargers. Uh, the distance to the nearest level two charger, in this case, it's 2.3 miles. The distance to the nearest EV corridor, in this case, it's a 10th of a mile. And then the highest functionally classified road within a quarter mile, in this case, it's an interstate and it happens to be 11 tenths of a mile away. And then it's also going to list out the amenities for you. And so we can see that we're near the Kenwood Town Center in the Sycamore Plaza. But then in addition, there's a series of restaurants that are nearby that would act as an amenity for someone who might be charging their EV and needed something to do while it was charging. And then finally, we have nearby traffic counts. So at OKI, we have a uh, very detailed traffic count database for the region. And what this does is it goes out and it pulls those nearby traffic counts and then displays them on the map. So you have an idea of what traffic nearby looks like and, and what the volumes look like. Obviously, this is gonna have an impact on uh, the usage that your EV charger gets. And then finally, we have this ability for you to create a report from this. And so if you click on the report, the export report as a PDF, um, it will generate a PDF and then you'll be able to download it. There'll be a download button that appears right here at the bottom. And when you do, it looks something like this. So it includes the location and then a map with basically everything that we've outlined below, uh, including the legend and then a summary of amenities and traffic counts and all that stuff. So if you want to use this in an application, um, it's something that's very easy, easy to then embed right into that PDF that you're going to upload to OEPA or State of Indiana or who else you may be applying for funds. And if you're not using it to apply for funds, but just want to have an idea of what the charging network in and around your area looks like and whether there's need there, it also helps uh, answer that question as well. A couple other things that I'll point out that the app does uh, is if you might have noticed in the bottom left-hand corner of the map, there are some checkboxes down there. And some things that we've included in there for you to look at are job hubs, EV registrations by zip code, and then functionally classified roadways. Currently, we only have 2018 data by zip code. We've been unable to acquire 2019 data from the BMV. We've been told that by the end of um, 2020 that they should have that data available to us again so that we will allow people to drill down. And as you zoom in, you'll see the zip code will become labeled as well as the number of EV registrations uh, in that zip code in parentheses underneath the zip code. Uh, job hubs are obviously important. These are hubs where uh, are economic engines for our region and we have large quantities of employees that work in here. This might be an area that someone might want to consider for uh, EV charging stations to um, fill a need for those workers as they work during the day. And so that's an overview of of our EV charging app. Again, we can take questions towards the end on this, but we, we hope that it's um, useful for you. We hope that you find value in it. 
and is something that's not going to be static over time as uh, new EV charging stations come online, we will continue to update the app uh, so that over time we'll see uh, more and more of our EV charging network here build out. I'm very excited to introduce our next presenter. Uh, Kevin Cushman is the CEO of Electrata, and he will bring you up to speed on their offerings, um, public-private partnership opportunity in this space that has potential to significantly change the EV charger landscape in our region. Kevin, electrify us if you would. Uh, David, thank you very much. Uh, first, I wanted to say thanks to Mark, Robin, uh, David, yourself, and Jen for orchestrating this, uh, this Zoom call, actually pretty impressive with over 100 participants. Um, we're very excited to be part of it. Uh, but before I start, I wanted to mention, uh, first of all, that uh, what David just showed you is something that uh, really is an asset for all the stakeholders here regionally to use and thinking about EVs, where they should go, the type of attributes um, everyone should be considering in where to most optimally place those and how to think about future proofing uh, an EV network uh, going forward. What I would ask though of everyone who's a, a participant, if you think about interacting with your state representatives or, or folks uh, at the BMV or OEPA, really the next time you spoke, speak to those folks, uh, think about pushing them on the release of that BMV data. It doesn't need to be personal data, it's obviously aggregate and anonymized data, but the lack of transparency on EV registrations really, really does potentially delay our ability to be smarter about where we put capital uh, into the network. So when we're almost uh, two thirds of the way through 2019 or 2020, working with 2018 data, a lot is changing uh, as the early slides that Mark shared showed you. Um, a, lot of, a lot going on on EV adoption and we should be able to keep pace and, and hopefully the BMV can can step up and, and provide more uh, readily available data that can help us on our decision tracks. So, but thank you, uh, thank you for that, David. Um, we are an interesting uh, and new participant uh, in, in the EV market. We've had the great pleasure to meet with several uh, of the, the folks uh, attending the meeting today on the municipal and county government side um, to, and greatly encouraged with the level of interest in working to find uh, EV charging infrastructure opportunities within your communities to advance any number of strategic initiatives, uh, the least of which, not the least of which is just presenting the opportunity for folks to make a decision to buy an EV. So a little bit about Electrata. Uh, we are a privately funded uh, company that was uh, commercially launched in April of this year. Uh, our investors uh, are completely comprised of Southwest Ohio uh, individuals and entities. Uh, who believed in the theme and the thesis of our company uh, from its inception, which is to build out a portfolio in our region of the country to address the need, uh, the gap essentially in infrastructure to support EV adoption as it's continuing to ramp uh, over the next several years. Um, but as we go through the next few slides, keep in mind that we are a, a different type of an approach uh, to the market and the opportunity and that we're bringing private capital technology and uh, the opportunity to look at deploying uh, EV charging infrastructure potentially in a more efficient uh, pattern or a more efficient manner. So our approach is to provide the region's highest performance EV charging network. We're looking to develop what we call a portfolio within the region. We're not looking to do work in New York or California or Texas. We're looking at an area bounded by where you could find yourself three or four hour drive from Cincinnati is kind of the center, uh, center of our region. A lot of the cities within our region, and especially in the OKI territory, uh, share a lot of uh, similar attributes. Underdevelopment of EV charging infrastructure, lack of visibility on data, and just an early adoption curve, which we all think uh, provides a nice recipe for becoming involved in conversations with, with stakeholders such as the attendees today. Our goal is to present opportunities to deploy EV charging for businesses, municipalities, communities, and fleet owners. We look primarily for where vehicles are parked uh, versus where they're traveling. Um, and to make more sense of that, think about the, the fact that 94% of the time a vehicle is, is parked versus in motion. Uh, we like to try to think about our portfolio development efforts is looking uh, to enable charging where, where vehicles will likely be parked for a decent amount of time, uh, an hour plus in most cases. Our model is to capitalize, deploy, and operate uh, charging infrastructure using long-term partner relationships. So entering into ho site host agreements and other partnerships we'll discuss in a little bit um, to really foster this idea of 
a multi-year long-term relationship. It's not a sale and, and runaway type of a situation. Uh, we intend to be a partner in the region for a long time. And then finally and importantly, uh, we've talked a lot about what it means to enable EV drivers to find it easier to adopt EVs and, and charge uh, during the course of their, their parking or driving. But another component of this is being a community or a regional partner means that we need to address clean transportation wherever the opportunity resides. And that means finding areas of inequity in certain communities so that folks like social services agencies and areas that are typically underserved uh, can join the effort uh, in, in adopting cleaner transportation in a lot of cases because those are some of the constituents who suffer the most from EPA non-attainment and, and pollution issues within our region, especially in the Ohio Valley. So in a nutshell, uh, our model consists of the following. Uh, for municipal partners, site host partners, we offer the ability to build in EV infrastructure uh, at no capital cost and to participate in the shared success uh, model with us as utilization uh, of the charging infrastructure increases over time. We're built on the idea of a high performance, highly reliable network approach where uptime and service level agreements govern the way our network operates. And finally, being a local and regional company, we're always close to the, the assets that we're deploying and, and supporting and the fact that we're no, a known quantity uh, within the region and interacting with folks on an ongoing basis means that our network is one of continuous commissioning. We're always gonna be there upgrading, changing the network to meet the changing demand uh, for EV drivers. As you think about the use cases uh, within a municipal government uh, environment, um, on the right hand side, you could find yourself saying oh, one of these four or five or multiple uh, of the use cases outlined here uh, apply to me, whether you're thinking more holistically about deploying smart city investments and sustainable transportation is one component, whether you're looking just to demonstrate uh, to potential employers or businesses looking to locate in your community, that you're a technology enabled community, that you're looking toward making your community a much more resilient and clean place to live and, and play, uh, or whether it's a, a broader approach to sustainable transportation that may include your own vehicles or your fleet vehicles. Any one of those uh, objectives can be met by working in partnership to bring uh, EV charging to your, to your community. Uh, on the left-hand side, our approach, um, the way we go at this is not to think about finding places for funding to go. It's thinking about where the charging loads and the use cases reside and where they will reside for the course of the next 10 years or so. So we look at things very much from an analytics bottoms up perspective. And this is why uh, tools like what David described to you are so important to keep uh, operating in a robust manner and be part of the, the conversation. So we're making decisions based on rigorous analytics. Accessibility, visibility, and networked uh, assets are, are definitely part of what, what we're bringing to the opportunity. And then again, providing the communities and our partners with the ability to demonstrate that you've invested in uh, becoming a sustainable community through clean transportation. Many of our conversations um, today and, and in early discussions with folks uh, attending uh, here and in, around the region have focused on deploying public EV charging for public access use um, at workplaces or uh, at government sites. Um, which is certainly part of the conversation. Um, on the left-hand side, we discuss some of the attributes that go into decision-making for us as a private investor in, in this environment. So it, things like adoption rates, access traffic count, the type of chargers that would likely be best fits for that location, and the overall use case we expect to see over the life of the assets themselves. How will that change? What additional investment will be required three, four, five years into it so we don't end up with a situation where we have abandoned or undersized uh, assets trying to serve a more rigorous load. Uh, and then on the right side, this is something that certainly can complement uh, a public charging strategy, which is to look at the city fleets. Uh, in the survey, several of you indicated that you're evaluating uh, electrification of your fleets over time, some more immediately, some uh, are considering it potentially down the road or not considering it. Uh, what I would submit is that looking at things from a cost per mile perspective, it seems to be where the market is moving and alternative structures to allow municipalities to look at their fleet uh, and really ring out the cost it takes to operate those vehicles over the course of that lifetime of a four or five year uh, purchase cycle or lease cycle 
uh, is where the market's going. Charging is a big component of that. And again, part of our model is to capitalize and work in partnership with uh, municipalities and, and county governments to make that happen more quickly. So in terms of how we do this, how we propose uh, within this environment and within what um, our friends from Ohio and Indiana, Kentucky, as well as the utilities are bringing to the conversation in terms of uh, opportunities for funding, we've promoted a public-private EV charging partnership as a way to essentially act as a glue factor uh, between all the different puzzle pieces so that it's very transparent to yourselves uh, as participants, to your constituents, to drivers, to corporations, uh, businesses uh, in, in your communities. So what we propose is taking full advantage of all the opportunities that exist outside of our capital, which would include EPA grants, utility incentives and rebates, other types of partnerships, tax rebates that may or may not be available to uh, municipal government, uh, given your status, and merging those into an environment where we'd ask the municipality to essentially provide an easement or a ground lease uh, a right for us to operate in places within the community. And we'd bring all the capital operational um, and uh, maintenance requirements to that individual location. So it's a capital free opportunity uh, for the municipality. And our goal is to ultimately press down on the cost per port or cost per charger required to get things deployed within your community. Therefore providing a lot more upside a lot earlier in terms of revenue share and success share with our community partners as well as just being able to proliferate a portfolio far more quickly than you would otherwise. Um, these are all tools in the toolkit down at the bottom, and we, we believe that this is a very configurable model, and we're very encouraged about the conversations we've had thus far about really right-sizing or customizing it for each community based on the mix of opportunities uh, in those communities. Specifically, how this applies to something like the OAPA grant um, again, we'll work through our methodology on site selection. We look at specific indicators of success for publicly available charging um, areas, places that may have public access, but maybe on private land, and present a portfolio by community or by county, and then look to merge those components that we bring to the table in terms of capital and operational backstop uh, and merge in uh, the grants and incentives to really create a nice balanced approach. And what we believe that uh, ends up with is that uh, demonstrated on, on this slide, which provides you the ability to act, actually act as a multiplier effect for grant funding, uh, rebate and incentive funding, and provide the ability to either really bring down the cost per port or cost per charger in any location, or create a multiplier effect where you could get the, the double the amount of charging capacity at the same site for the same uh, level of uh, government investment or EPA uh, VW investment. But in many cases, can't discount uh, the components of even what Aladdin mentioned in terms of longer range reporting and operational requirements associated with pulling in grant funding. We take care of all of that in a turnkey environment. So our goal is to allow you guys to focus on what you do really, really well, which is serve your communities and allow us to come in and act as a component uh, of that service solution for specifically for, for the EV solution. An example of how economic benefit share works uh, within our public-private partnership model is very simple. Um, we believe that because we have the access uh, to public sites, or in some cases private sites, we, we do this, uh, we implement the same measure or metric with public and private partners that we're working with. System utilization rate is a metric we use to determine how successful that charging implementation is over time. And on a very strict uh, linear basis, the more charging that occurs on uh, the hours that are available for charging at that site, the more our public partners should share in that upside. So again, we're early in the S curve of adoption uh, on EVs in this region, but certainly over the next three or four years with new models proliferating into the market, we believe the opportunities to create a, a value stream for our community partners is there. And this is a very transparent way of demonstrating that we're completely aligned. Our capital is going in to a partnership uh, that we, we intend to share as, as a partnership uh, for the foreseeable future. And then finally, as far as thinking about how do we go about doing something like this, uh, because we're not looking to sell you equipment, we're not looking to um, uh, essentially act as a mediator in a purchase environment, we're acting as a partner, uh, a portfolio partner, the components of the public-private partnership need to include not just a term that makes sense, that's visible, 
upon which we can de deploy capital from our, our private investors uh, and they can see the value of having done that. But also creating the visibility on the economic share, the fact that we work with bonded and insured contractors, our technology partners are commercially available partners that have been deployed all over the world, um, performing in very rigorous circumstances uh, in large cities, as well as with utilities. Um, and then finally, making sure that the agreement is able to be uh, changed and, and uh, really dynamically managed over time. So as the needs for capacity increase uh, over time, we can react to those and think about making sure that there's no abandoned resources or abandoned assets and it continues to be a source of pride for your communities. So in, a, in, in summary, what I'd like to say is we're very pleased to be a new, new participant in the market. Um, we realize it's early on for several of you uh, considering how to think about EVs. We're very, very interested um, in teaming up with you. And because the timing is very coincident around the grant process, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Our, talk, our contact information is here um, and we'd certainly love to continue the conversation. David, back to you. Thank you, Kevin, for your presentation. I hope everyone is excited about this amazing 3P opportunity as we are. Uh, we think that this is going to give a lot of communities the ability to jump into EVs that otherwise might have been hesitant to do so. It's time for another quick poll question regarding public-private partnerships. Jen, will you please show question number three? So our question here is, will you consider partnering with a third party to provide EV charging stations for your community? All right, well, this is very exciting. It looks like about 69% of you uh, would consider partnering in a 3P situation. Uh, we're about a quarter of you still need more information, but uh, it's very exciting to hear. And it sounds like uh, you folks might be in touch with Electrata here soon. Our next presentation today is about utility company incentives for EVs and pinch hitting for Jordan Walby of Duke is OKI's own strategic initiatives manager, Robin Bancroft. Robin, you're up to bat. Thank you, David. Good morning, everybody. And I'm going to share my screen. I do have a couple of slides for you all. Here we go. And I know there's been a lot of information shared this morning. I'm hoping uh, everyone is, is uh, excited about everything that's been discussed. And uh, OKI, we have kept in constant contact with our partners at Duke Energy. So I'm happy this morning to just hit some highlights of Duke's current activities in the EV space. So I'm gonna start with Ohio, and Duke currently has a filing before the Public Utilities Commission of Ohio. You see the two objectives for um, their power forward filing uh, there on the screen. And also you see Duke's uh, service area for our Southwest Ohio counties which of course include majority of the OKI region in addition to Brown County. So what I'm gonna do is hit the five programs that Duke is proposing uh, to uh, the Utility Commission of Ohio for specifically for Southwest Ohio. There's, there's five programs. And first of all is the fast charging program. This is where Duke would install all the necessary electrical infrastructure uh, up to the customer owned charging station at a minimum of 25 commercial charging sites. The second program is the electric school bus program uh, where Duke would uh, give up to $215,000 rebate towards an all electric school bus. The third program is for our public transit agencies where Duke would install similarly um, the infrastructure up to uh, the transit charging stations for uh, up to 10 public transportation electric buses. The fourth program uh, is where uh, for level two chargers, Duke would provide that infrastructure up to the charging stations um, at up to 1200 uh, installations. And I wanna emphasize again, this is in our Southwest Ohio in that Duke uh, service region. And fifth and final component uh, of the uh, filing is the residential rebate program where Duke would uh, provide to customers a $500 uh, rebate uh, for the installation of a new level two charging station and then up to 500 in ongoing payments for participation in the EV charging load management. So I just wanna emphasize, I know that was really super quick, 
um, but just to hit those elements uh, of uh, the filing that Duke's got before uh, PUCO right now, and just to emphasize that it hasn't been approved. We're hoping to hear about it soon. Also, similarly for our Kentucky and Indiana attendees that are listening in, Duke had a similar uh, program proposals in both of our uh, other state member states, uh, but unfortunately those were denied. So Duke's in the process right now of reevaluating uh, both of the proposals for Indiana and Kentucky. So we're hoping to hear something new on that front soon. So just in closing, um, I, I pitch hit it here for our partner, Jordan Walpe at Duke. And just wanna encourage you all, if you have not introduced yourself or made contact with Jordan, regardless of your state, if you're in the OPI region, uh, Jordan is our contact at Duke. And I really encourage you, you see his email there on the screen, uh, to send an email, a hello, uh, to mention that you got his email uh, here today from this OPI workshop. Um, and to just make that contact. Uh, Duke is a, an eager uh, partner uh, with us as we uh, pursue our EV infrastructure. So that concludes my really quick highlights. And uh, it was a, it's a pleasure being with you all this morning. Thank you, David, back to you. Thank you, Robin. And our final presentation of the day is by OKI's tip manager, Andy Reeser. Andy will fill you, fill you in about fleet funding opportunities from a variety of OKI managed funding programs. Andy, take it away. Well, good morning, all. Um, so as far as funding opportunities that OKI has here available uh, to you, um, most of our capital projects here at OKI come through uh, federal funds in the FAST Act, which is Fixing America's Surface Transportation Act. Uh, that authorization runs through fiscal year 2020 and expires this September. Um, although we're not optimistic there's going to be a new bill to replace it, we are optimistic there's going to be a short-term extension that's going to continue those funds. Um, the, the programs that are within the FAST Act, at least the highway programs, uh, these are the major ones. Surface Transportation Block Grant Program, or STBG. Highway Safety Improvement Program, HSIP. And then the one I wanted to emphasize today is Congestion Mitigation and Air Quality Improvement Program, or CMAC. There's also a few other programs, Transportation Alternatives, which focuses on pedestrian and bicycle and uh, uh, pedestrian uh, um, infrastructure, as well as the National Highway Performance Program. Most of these programs require a 20% local match the exception here is the Highway Safety Improvement Program is just a 10% match. And some of these programs uh, are, get suballocated to the urban areas like OKI, where we have discretion on how these funds are spent. So as far as our annual allocation for transportation projects, it's divided by state for us. Our, our four counties in Ohio, we get about 25 million a year in STBG funds about 2.6 million in transportation alternatives funds. And for CMAC, you get around 12 million a year. Uh, that number is a little bit flexible because it is a statewide program that has about 61 million statewide. So we do have some flexibility there. If one year uh, Cleveland has more needs than Cincinnati does, we can put more uh, resources to Cleveland and so forth. Um, in Kentucky, uh, STBG, we get about seven and a half million, and TA about 450,000. No uh, CMAC in Kentucky is directly suballocated to OKI, although Kentucky does have CMAC. It just runs through their central office at the Kentucky Transportation Cabinet. And then Indiana, we do get a small amount of CMAC dollars every year, about 64,000 for Dearborn County, which is our only county in Indiana. So let me get in more details here about CMAC. Uh, projects eligible for CMAC, they must result in quantifiable mobile source emission reductions. So when you have an application, we, you have to be able to show and uh, show your calculations on what the forecasted emission reductions is gonna be out into the near future. And CMAC projects must be located in an air quality non-attainment or maintenance area. That's all of OKI. And uh, there's projects that are eligible for CMAC include, include uh, traffic flow, such as turn lanes, roundabouts, uh, diesel engine retrofits, 
uh, some types of freight and intermodal projects, transit capital projects, bicycle pedestrian improvements, carpooling and van pooling programs, and then alternative fuel vehicles for transit and public fleets, as well as alter alternative fuel infrastructure is also eligible for CMAC. So every year we have a prioritization process and a call for projects. Uh, we are in the middle of one right now where we're evaluating project applications that have been received. Um, so it's a little bit late for the 2020 process, but the next one will be our 2021 prioritization process where we'll be um, looking at applications for STBG, CMAC, and TA funds in Ohio, and then Kentucky SNK, which is their equivalent equivalent to STVG and TA funds. So we'll have about 12 million CMAC available, and that's in fiscal year 25. So that is uh, one drawback, I guess, of CMAC is we do program funds out uh, pretty far out, and that's really to accommodate many of these projects that have to go through design and right away, and uh, it, it can be a lengthy process. But if we do award you funds for fiscal year 25, there's often ways we can uh, accelerate that. And if we have projects that are delayed or canceled, we can often move the project up and, and we'll do so uh, if we possibly can. Um, so the schedule for that is March of next year, 2021. We'll have a funding workshop and applications will be available. Uh, those applications will be due in June of next year. And then our OKI board will make the project selections in October of next year. And then for CMAC projects in Ohio, in Ohio, there's one additional step where it goes through the statewide CMAC committee will also review those projects. So as I said, we'll go through our prioritization process, which is uh, scoring, you score on various things, safety, travel time, impact on travel time, all kinds of things, totaling 105 points. For CMAC pro uh, projects, the emphasis is really on cost effectiveness. So we'll be looking at the amount of emissions that you have forecasted in your project and what are the dollars, what are the federal CMAC dollars that you are requesting and evaluate uh, that for cost effectiveness. As far as projects in our current transportation improvement program, which looks out through the next four years, we have about 25 CMAC projects in our TIP right now, totaling about 78 million. Uh, and you can see the types of projects there. We have several turn lanes, um, six bus replacement projects. Those are very popular. Uh, six bicycle pedestrian projects, a bunch of roundabouts. We funded oh, probably 20 or more roundabouts throughout the OKI region uh, through CMAC as well as STBG. Um, and then signal upgrades as well is very popular for our CMAC program. Uh, no alternative fuel projects in there at the moment, but uh, we're definitely open and willing to fund any electric vehicle or other alternative fuel projects. I'm excited if you would, would apply for that. So I'll just give you a quick example of kind of the diversity of projects in our CMAC program. Here's one that's getting ready to uh, go uh, later this year or early next year, which is Great Parks, Little Miami Trail. Uh, Beachmont connector across the Beachmont uh, levee there. And so very excited about that because it's going to connect two portions of the trail that haven't been connected before. So, and we awarded about 4.3 million in CMAC to that project. Another example of CMAC projects is bus replacements. Uh, every year we fund multiple uh, bus replacements for Sorta, Tank, uh, Butler County. Uh, all over the, the tri-state. This particular project, we awarded $5.8 million to SORTA to get 15 new clean diesel technology buses. Now, even though it says clean diesel technology buses, uh, SORTA is actively looking for ways to add additional funds to these, uh, to our existing CMAC funds to make them electric if possible. And so SORTA continues to explore ways to, to uh, you know, diversify their, their fuel portfolio, portfolio. One other project uh, I want to highlight is a, a roundabout project in Montgomery. This is at Pfeiffer Road and Deerfield Road. And so uh, roundabouts are very popular, as I mentioned. 
Uh, one other program I wanted to mention to you, this is not from the highway account, this is from the federal mass transit account. So each year OKI provides FTA or Federal Transit Administration funds to purchase paratransit vans for eligible agencies providing trips for seniors and individuals with disabilities. The current active fleet count is 112 with 19 new vehicles being purchased this year. As EV technologies are becoming more available for these vehicle types, we see an excellent opportunity for transitioning this fleet to EVs in the future and we are working with FTA and ODOT in order to ensure EVs are available to our agencies. And then one other thing I wanted to mention is our community energy plans. Um, OKI is very involved with this. Uh, during the past two years, OKI along with our partner, um, the Greater Cincinnati Energy Alliance has worked with these eight communities that you see on the left part of your screen to create a local community energy plan for each community. Local governments can play an influential role in promoting energy efficiency and cleaner sources of energy in their communities are outcomes that improve the health and economic situations of residents and businesses. Local gov governments are also consumers of energy and the plans look for ways that governments can use less energy and save money. And the other Andy at OKI is Andy Meyer and he is the primary contact here at OKI for our community energy plans. So please contact him if you have questions. And you can also visit our project website for that, which is energy.oki.org. And that is all the information I have for you today. I'll send it back to you, David. Thank you, Andy. Um, as you can see, our some of our internal projects and programs are really lacking a lot of good EV uh, applicants and EV projects. So part of the purpose today was to make you aware of these opportunities and hope that in the future, uh, you will bring good projects forward that we can fund uh, with these dollars that will help uh, clean the air even more than some of our existing projects. And now we, want, we have one last poll question for you today. Jen, would you sh please show question number four? And so this one is, do you have an interest in utilizing CMAC or 5310 funds to electrify your fleets? Okay, we'll go ahead and cut it off. It looks like about 37% of you are interested. 14% uh, said no, and almost half of you need more information. And that's certainly understandable. And if we can help in that realm, uh, again, feel free to contact Andy Reza on our staff and he'll be more than glad to provide you with that information. Uh, so now it's time for your questions. Uh, we've had a few questions pop up in the Q&A box, and I, most of those have been answered online. If you have additional questions, we would go ahead and take those now. I will say there was uh, a question about whether or not we're recording this webinar. We are recording the webinar, and it will be made available uh, for those that may have come in late or people that were unable to see it. We will uh, push that out through some of our social media channels and let you know when that's available. We expect it'll probably be by, uh, by the end of the week. Uh, but if you have questions now, please go ahead and put those into the Q&A box and our panelists will answer those as appropriate. Okay, it looks like we have one in here. Does our community being designated a CRA have any impact on the possibility of an EV station in our community? Um, I will kick that out to our state partners to find out if it, in their process of VW funds, if that has any impact or not. Hey, David, I'll go ahead and ask the question. I actually, can you help me out? What's CRA? Community reinvestment area. Okay, uh, no, so in the VW program, that is not uh, a factor. And because the VW program in uh, the state of Ohio, I think as with other states, is primarily based on air quality metrics in the 26 counties I mentioned earlier. Um, that's one of four factors that went into selecting the counties, but a big ticket item there was uh, a non-attainment for certain criteria pollutants um, and primarily ozone. So that's what's the, the driver for this program is uh, to help address air quality issues in these counties. Thank you. Any other questions from the group? Give you another minute or so to get this typed in if you have questions. Here's one. Does OKI have any way to provide the customer service from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. instead of separate agencies trying to do this on their own? 
Uh, yes, um, David, I think yes. she's referring to the 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. requirement Monday through Saturday. That is part of our RFA that says that uh, you have to have customer support uh, via telephone for people using the equipment. Gotcha. And the answer is yes. Uh, but I mean, I don't, I don't see OKI as uh, providing that. I see the vendor that, like, say you're, uh, let's forgive me the rest of you, but say you're the city of Hamilton and you've applied to our program and you'll come in with your application with a vendor selected. It may be Electrada, it may be any other vendor of your choice. And um, so when you get the quote from your vendor for the, the service, they should include for you that information as well. So when there's a phone number on there, we don't expect that call to go to the city of Hamilton or to OKI. We expect that call to go to someone at uh, the, the service provider that you've selected um, to provide that service. And that also is a pretty commonly available service. So again, I mean, because for a lot of people it will be new, a lot of users won't have charged their cars outside of their own homes, particularly with level two, if they come up to a charging station and if somehow they can't figure it out or if it's not working, then something on the chargers has to give them like the ability to call someone and find out what they need to do. And so the 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. also is a pretty standard requirement that we've seen in many other states as well. And one that vendors say that they easily provide anyway. Thank you for the clarification, Aloudin. Mm -hmm. We have another question. We are currently working on building a transit center in our community. If we looked at the area to have both a transit center and an EV station, would okay I have grant monies or assistance available for this type of project? Andy Reeser, would you like to take that question, please? Uh, yeah, I think uh, you know building on some type of infrastructure that's already there uh, or is about to go in uh, would be a good use of our funds. You know, we'd have to take a look at it as far as how it is, uh, you know, in the application and what kind of uh, cost effectiveness is calculated there, but. Yeah, that's something that could be eligible. Hey, David, this is Mark. Um, yes. You know, we're uh, investing in a transit station in uh, Uptown currently. And I know in our discussions with um, the city, they're very interested in putting in EV portals. So yeah, we're uh, it's something on our radar that we'd be able to invest in. Thank you, Mark. We have another question. Specifically, what support is there for establishing an L2 or DC fast charger in a condo community in downtown Cincinnati over 100 units? So I think there's a couple of different opportunities here. If you were to work with um, the city, uh, you could work on a, assuming that that's publicly available, you could work on some of the OEPA funding, or you could reach out to Electrata. Um, I don't know if Kevin, you want to talk quickly about this and what you might be able to offer in this situation? Sure, thanks David. Um, it's a great question. We're working with multiple uh, community developers now. Uh, this is a great example. So it really boils down to the use case and the desired use case for the condo owner or the community itself. Do they wanna have folks uh, available to come in and charge their vehicles that aren't residents? Uh, it's one big question that helps to determine uh, how funds from public entities can be used in that circumstance. If it's truly a dedicated resident amenity, that's something that we'd be interested in capitalizing uh, in partnership with you. So that conversation can be uh, more direct and, and probably uh, get underway quickly. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Here's another one. Is there any consideration at the state to raise the project award cap for the BW program? Awards at current per vehicle award cap can only fund a very small portion of new public transit EVs. And again, I'll kick this to any of our state partners if they wanna jump in and answer this one. Uh, David, I suppose I can, I can go first. Um, just wanna make sure I understand the question correctly. Uh, our cap is uh, 7,500 for a single port charger and $15,000 for a dual port charger that would be the high end of what we would invest and it would get lower than that if your actual eligible project cost is less than that. Uh, for a public entity, if 100% of your costs are less than that and for a non-public government entity or location, if 80% of your cost is less than that, 
Uh, when we were surveying states, I can honestly say that only AEP's rebate program had an allocation higher than that. I'm not aware of others. Obviously, each state makes a new offering every year. So we feel pretty comfortable with what we're offering. Um, I'm, so again, I mean, I think that we that should take care of it. But if you know, if you've got vendors or others who are telling you that that's too less and that's not going to, I certainly ask you to reach out to more um, vendors. I'd certainly ask you to take advantage of, particularly if you're actually even if you're not a public entity, this DAS state term contract is you know you can use the Freedom of Information Act to get at your hands on that contract, even if you can't sign it even as a non-governmental entity, um, you can take a look at the prices that have been quoted on there. So I, we, we feel pretty good about the fact that we've actually had a really generous allocation. As a matter of fact, to a pri prior question, I don't know if that was answered publicly or not. I mean, uh, Minnesota set aside 3,200, 3,250 per charger. Ours is 7,500, uh, but we made it that much more because again, we wanted to make a commitment to our site hosts that not only are we trying to help subsidize the cost of the charger, but because we're asking you to get the five-year maintenance contract, to get you know, the networking for your charger, to get the best use out of your investment, we're also upping what we're investing and we're kind of mentally prepared to get fewer chargers because of a higher per charger allocation. So, um, you know, I hope you take advantage of that and take a look at some of the pricing um, that's out there. Thank you, Loudon. Mm -hmm. We have another question that's come in. What other private partners exist? And so we know that, I guess it depends on the exact service you're looking for. If you're looking for a full turnkey solution, um, that may vary from people that just want to come in and sell you the equipment. So as Loudon alluded to, there's certainly seven organizations that have um, been vetted through the state that are available and that the information on those is available in the OEPA uh, documents. Uh, but our, our assumption is there's probably other private partners out there as well. We brought Electrata forward because uh, number one, they're local and number two, they've reached out to us about opportunities in this space. But um, there's certainly other companies that can do uh, or offer same or similar services. Any other questions? If there's none, uh, we'd like to thank you for attending our webinar today. And thank you to all of our presenters for taking the time out of your busy schedules to come and present today. We think that the information has been very useful. We hope that it's been informative and that you can use this information to further deployment of EVs and EV infrastructure across our region. If you decide to apply for VW settlement funds directly or partner with a third party to apply for funds, please let us know. We would like to track how the funds are being utilized across our region. Um, with that, uh, thank you everyone and have a great day.